Morning. Well, welcome to uh, day two of TechEd. Hope you guys have had a good morning and uh, hopefully got a good session in and got breakfast. I missed breakfast, didn't get there quite in time. Um, we're going to be talking about advanced threat detection and remediation uh, using forefront endpoint protection. So forefront endpoint protection uh, 2010 is the new version of our anti-malware client. It actually shipped uh, back in December and has been available since January. So it's on the market now. This is the current version of our uh, endpoint protection product. Uh, I'm Randy Trite. Um, this is Jason, and we're from the uh, anti-malware engineering team. So we're the team that builds the core uh, scanning and protection capabilities that go into Forefront. Uh, it also goes into uh, other products, such as if you're familiar with, for example, Microsoft Security Essentials. Uh, it's the same uh, technology that's used in that product as well. And we, we're actually used, our, our engine's used in a bunch of other products, Forefront for Exchange, Forefront for SharePoint. Windows um, Intune. Windows Intune. Uh, forget that one. Yes, shouldn't forget that one. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so we're gonna we're gonna kind of trade off on and off. Um, uh, I'm gonna we've got some great demos and uh, we'll uh, we'll dive right in. So uh, just to provide a little bit of context about what we do um, and how we think about the the threat landscape and the anti malware space. Uh, you know, the, the world has changed quite a bit, um, and there's a few different sort of challenges that we have to deal with. Uh, malware threats used to be relatively simple, and let me see a, a show of hands of uh, who in the, in the room remembers getting uh, an email like this. <laughs> right, I think probably we all did, uh, if we were working in, in any kind of uh, 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 capacity back in, in 2000, and, you know, even at Microsoft, I remember we got, you know, the, the funny thing about the I love you virus was that uh, you knew who uh, had clicked on the attachment because it sent you know, the mail to everybody in, in their address book. So you could see which uh, uh, like executives um, or you know, probably it was their assistants actually clicked on the, uh, the virus. But th this used to be the paradigm, right? You would get an attachment in email. You know, if you were at all security conscious, you would say, hey, I know not to click on that. Uh, that's clearly, you know, doc, space, 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 dot exe, or whatever. Uh, it's clearly something that's malicious. And, and we used to do, spend a lot of time uh, educating users about, uh, hey, don't click on uh, attachments in, in email, and then we filtered those out in Outlook, et cetera. Uh, but it was a fairly simple, straight, uh, straightforward uh, kind of process. And, 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 you know, there was nothing really complex. It was just the malware authors trying to get you to, you know, double click and run some uh, executable. Uh, the world has changed quite a bit. So with the advent of you know, Web 2.0 and just the move to the web and, and um, just this online connected world that we live in today, uh, you know, the malware authors are taking advantage of that also. So you know, today, instead of getting a simple uh, executable file in an email, uh, users can get infected without even knowing that they ever did anything and, and with it being uh, completely non-obvious. Uh, and, and this is just you know, one example of a scenario, uh, a fairly common one, for how, how this works in today's world. So uh, user is vulnerable in some fashion, so their computer is you know, oftentimes uh, has browser plugins, for example, that are out of date, uh, that have vulnerabilities that have been patched, but they're still on an old version. Uh, my twin brother actually just got infected a few months ago because uh, on his home machine, which uh, he hardly ever uses since he mostly uses his laptop, uh, he had an old version of uh, a Flash plugin, uh, didn't even realize it was there, was searching for some programming stuff, uh, clicked a link in Google, and basically got uh, uh, the malware installed on the system through this kind of process. So, you know, they'll uh, poison the search results, you know, that fourth link, you click on it, uh, it takes you to a page that looks legitimate, but there's some sort of, you know, zero pixel iframe or, or other hidden element that loads another page. Um, and eventually you get redirected to a page hosting malicious script that knows how to try and exploit uh, whatever vulnerabilities uh, your computer might have, which could be, you know, browser plugin, um, it could be the uh, operating system itself, could be the web browser, or any other uh, uh, software that, that's in the, uh, in the path there. Uh, and once you basically, and this is all happening behind the scenes, you don't even realize it's going on. And then, you know, the, the script executes, exploits the vulnerability, uh, runs code uh, on your system, uh, oftentimes without the user even being aware of that, that they're getting infected. And this is, you know, one of, of many, many different sort of uh, uh, techniques that the malware authors are using. And it really has, uh, you know, it, it's a new, a new world uh, and kind of a new game. 
Uh, in addition, you know, part of the reason that things are getting so sophisticated is that the, you know, the motivation for the malware authors is completely different than it was 10 years ago. You know, writing the I love you virus and um, sending that out and, you know, it was more of a, you know, kind of that uh, vandalism sort of like, hey, this is, you know, let's see how many machines I can infect and uh, kind of bragging rights in the hacker community. Uh, those days are over and now, you know, malware is, is big business in the, the uh, organized crime and, and kind of uh, black market world. So, uh, you know, the, the motivation is really a profit motive. So, uh, if I'm a malware author, I can basically sell my uh, malicious code to, uh, you know, one of these bot herders. They'll tr get as many machines infected as they can through these various techniques. And then, you know, it's sort of like uh, kind of a black market version of cloud computing. They're basically selling this compute resources um, to be used for nefarious purposes. You want to have your, uh, you know, competitor's website taken offline. Hey, I've got 10,000 infected machines I can, uh, you know, lease out to you. Uh, we'll spam them with, uh, you know, denial of service traffic or, you know, we can give you access to this and you can do whatever you want with it. You want to send, uh, you know, we'll take that website down and hopefully your, your uh, customers will come to your website. Uh, you want to send spam? Hey, I've got, you know, thousands of machines that can send millions of messages a day. Just, you know, pay me some money and uh, we'll, we'll send all the spam you want. So, uh, and, and, you know, you can go to these, uh, uh, they're basically like black market auction sites like eBay where you can go in and just see, you know, different uh, uh, of these guys who have their botnets set up. They're all bidding for your business and, and you know, they have special deals and uh, it, it's, you know, it's just... Uh, uh, lots and lots of money to be made here. Um, in addition to that, the volume of threats that we have to deal with and the volume of malware is actually uh, exploding at a pretty, uh, pretty impressive rate. Um, and probably this isn't news to anybody, uh, but we, I just looked at some numbers on, you know, how many malicious kind of samples did we used to get? And back in 2006, it was on the order of tens of thousands. Today, it's on the order of tens of millions uh, per year that we have to sort through and prioritize and figure out which ones are actually a threat to customers and figure out how do we detect those. So that's a little bit about the, uh, uh, just kind of the landscape that, you know, what, what do we lie awake at night uh, worrying about and trying to figure out how do we deal with some of these challenges? Uh, this is it, and this is, you know, when we talk about some of the improvements that we've made in uh, forefront endpoint protection, these are some of the challenges that we're trying to overcome. You know, the complexity of the threats uh, is, is uh, ex you know, getting, um, the threats are getting much more complex, so if you look at things like the Alurion rootkit, or I'm sure everybody's here probably heard of Stuxnet, you know, a very, very advanced threat, uh, we're just going to start seeing more and more of those uh, and, and in higher volume. So to talk a little bit about what our team does and um, what we provide, so from an anti-malware standpoint, there's a couple of different uh, things to look at. So one is the actual core uh, protection platform itself, and this is the uh, uh, the technology that goes into forefront endpoint protection, you know, security essentials, Intune. Uh, you know, we had a version of the platform that shipped in forefront client security. We've made a whole bunch of investments in, in new uh, capabilities in, in the new platform, which goes into FEP 2010, which goes into MSE and Intune. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those. Uh, the technology that we ship on a monthly basis is our actual scanning engine. Uh, and that's what uses those uh, capabilities in the platform to be able to detect and um, uh, protect uh, customers from getting infected. And then our, uh, our counterparts in the Microsoft Malware Protection Center, the virus researchers and analysts, they're the ones that are leveraging this technology by writing uh, new signatures and shipping those. And those go out uh, three times per day. Um, so, and then we have this new dynamic signature service, which Jason's going to uh, show you guys and talk about, uh, which lets us deliver signatures in real time from the cloud. Uh, so we've had a lot of improvements that we've made in the platform. I don't have time uh, right now in, in this session to go into all of these. So we're just going to highlight a few of them. But uh, I do urge you all to come to our booth. Uh, we're, we're in the forefront endpoint protection booth, and we can talk about all this other great stuff that we've done. Uh, so just a few things that we're going to go over. So live system behavior monitoring. Jason's going to talk about that, uh, as well as the dynamic signature service, which I just mentioned. Uh, I'll talk about network vulnerability shielding and, and some of the work we've done in our uh, network inspection system, or, or what we call NIS. Uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll touch on uh, some anti-rootkit intelligence that we've added in the way that we actually do scanning. Uh, so just to, to give you kind of the high-level overview of, of, you know, how we think about protection in Forefront, uh, there, there were a couple of main investments that we made in, in FEP 2010, and, you know, 
Uh, the big one uh, in terms of the overall product is the integration with System Center Configuration Manager. If you've been to any of the other PEP sessions, you probably saw a good overview of that. Um, and, uh, you know, part of what we're trying to do is what we call operationalized security. So operationalizing security means finding that balance between uh, protection and performance. You know, you can have really great protection, but if the customer's machine, uh, your user's machines are so bogged down, that they go and turn off real-time protection because they're perceiving that, hey, the, you know, the system's just running slow, uh, then, then the machine's not actually going to be protected. So to have you know, good protection, you need to also have great performance. And so we've really focused on uh, finding that balance and trying to provide you know, really good performance. One of the things that you'll, if you use Microsoft Security Essentials at home or if you've rolled out FEP, you'll see compared to like Forefront Client Security, very, very low footprint, uh, very minimal, you know, kind of runs in the background. You hardly even know that it's running. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the actual core uh, protection capabilities, there's a lot of stuff we've done. Uh, I'm not going to go into every bullet, um, but I'll just touch on a few things. So we have a lot more monitoring capabilities uh, than we've had in the past. Again, lots of performance improvements. We do a lot of caching uh, that we didn't do before. You know, our, our goal is that, hey, if we've scanned a file and we know that it's not uh, malicious and nothing has changed, you know, we shouldn't have to scan that file again. So we're doing a lot of that kind of thing. Uh, CPU throttling, lots of great stuff. Again, come by the booth and uh, we'll, we'll go into uh, some of this other stuff. So the way that we you know, think about uh, uh, protecting a, uh, you know, the end user's system and the endpoint, there's really two main scenarios. And the top priority is obviously we want to uh, protect the system from getting infected to begin with. So if we can block the malware when it tries to execute or keep the user from you know, even having the, the opportunity to infect the system, that, that's our main goal. And so uh, we have a number of different ways that we do that. Um, and one of the big ones is through our generics and heuristics capability. So you know, malware is constantly changing. It's not you know, the days of having static signature files where you know, the signature is basically, hey, this signature detects this file, are you know, years behind us, right? We can't, uh, I showed you the slide with the volume. We can't you know, provide good protection if we're just you know, doing that sort of file-based signature. So we have to look at, well, what is the actual uh, uh, program doing and make sure that we can detect those patterns of behavior uh, when we scan the file before it gets uh, before it gets executed and the old-fashioned way of doing that was to run it in an emulator and that's what we used to do and in forefront uh, uh, client security that's you know we have uh, uh, when that first came out we had in the engine you know kind of an, uh, an old-school emulator where we would in memory be emulating this stuff uh, with uh, forefront endpoint protection and, and the improvements we've made in the engine, we now have uh, what we call dynamic translation. And so what we're doing is looking for uh, you know, the same kind of patterns that we had before um, with our generics and heuristic capabilities. So hey, do, if we see this pattern of API calls uh, that we know is always used in this family of malware, we can match on those, you know, we can look for those API calls in the, in the program and say, oh yeah, this is you know, uh, this family of malware and detect it, regardless of all the other changes that they make to the files. And most of these you know, malware uh, uh, that's out in the wild today, it's constantly changing. They're constantly releasing new versions. Uh, every time the program runs, it might uh, change itself. It might use different uh, packers, different uh, uh, decryptors. Um, and so the, the way that we're uh, able to uh, deal with that is through this dynamic translation capability. And dynamic translation is really about moving the uh, execution of the malware uh, from the emulator in, the, in memory in the engine uh, onto the actual CPU and running it on the bare metal itself. And the way we do that is we actually translate the instructions in the, uh, you know, the suspected program uh, into uh, actual machine instructions that we can run on the processor. So we take the you know, instructions and essentially translate them into uh, safe instructions. So instructions that can be executed, but they're not ever going to do anything bad. Um, and what that lets us do is run uh, much, much faster, because we're running on the actual processor, take advantage of you know, the new uh, hardware that's out there, and that lets us actually emulate much, much, much deeper in the same amount of time so that we can get you know, way deep into what the thing is doing uh, and then decide that, oh yeah, this is malware, we need to block it, or it's safe, let's, uh, you know, let's go ahead and let it execute. So that's one of the, the main performance improvements that we have. So this time I'm going to hand off to uh, Jason. He's going to talk a, a little bit about uh, the other side of the coin. So you know, generics and heuristics, that's really kind of the blocking. How do we, uh, one of the features for how we prevent customers from getting infected. Uh, the other one that Jason's going to talk about is how do we find out about new malware that we don't have detection for. 
All right, thanks, Randy. Morning, everybody. Thanks for coming to TechEd. Hope you're having a good time. Weather seems to be improving, so that's good. Um, happy about that. Trying to leave the Seattle rain behind uh, ourselves. We had record rainfall the last couple of days, so this is a nice change. So uh, behavior monitoring, as Randy mentioned, uh, we're both uh, PMs in the anti-mower engine. And one of the features that I own is behavior monitoring and then the anti rug kit story. So I'll be talking about both here this, uh, this morning to you. So behavior monitoring, it, it's uh, a good way to think about it is to think about it, it's, it's kind of our hoover of events on the system. So what we look for are things like uh, process events, file events, registry events, uh, monitoring things like the volume boot record, master boot record, and sort of reassembling those series of events and seeing if it matches a pattern that malware authors use. And I'm going to show you some examples of that in a little bit. I'm going to show you a, a, a rogue AV application and I'm going to show you a, um, a root kit, a dropper for a root kit, and show how behavior monitoring can look for those series of events and then uh, take action on, on the machine or uh, send an event back to, uh, to Microsoft so that we can collect a sample of that uh, piece of malware, potential malware, analyze it, determine if it's uh, malicious or not, and uh, eventually start remediating and blocking. Um, so right, so what we do um, with those sensors is, um, you know, collect that data in real time, throw it into a queue, and then match it against what we call the behavior monitoring set of signatures. So what that does is it moves that um, out of our, it used to be hard-coded in the engine, and we moved that into a signature-based approach so that we can add new detections, modify existing ones if they uh, prove to be either uh, incapable of, of detecting anything, or uh, God forbid they go false positive. So we can quickly turn those off um, and, and modify them and do the right thing there. Um, so, right, so, um, yeah, I think I covered this slide. So here are all the behavior monitoring, monitoring notifications that we do today. As I mentioned, we do some things for the file system, the registry, we have some network detections, and then we have this sort of other category and can use those to, um, to write the detections with. And so what I'm going to do as part of my demo is I'm going to show you the kind of the bottom left one there, file system for detecting droppers and file infectors. And then I'm going to show you one that uh, makes a registry change to disable the uh, uh, UAC so that the user is not prompted when, uh, when applications try and elevate and things like that. Okay, so here's, um, again, a, sort of an overview of, of some of the things that we look for. Uh, the Trojan dropper, we look for events on the file system, and uh, we can also trap the process that tried to drop the, the known bit of malware and uh, package the dropper up is what we do with that first one. Uh, the second one, a master boot record change or a VBR record change should be very infrequent, so that's not something a, a normal non-malicious uh, piece of software would do. Obviously, there's exceptions to that. There's um, other third-party tools that will repartition your software and things like that. Uh, we do have mechanisms in place, though, to make sure that if a file is signed and it's from a trusted publisher and things like that, we're not going to go crazy and, and start uh, false positiving on that. So, we, you know, we do have plenty of things incorporated into the engine to know what applications should be considered safe uh, versus those that aren't signed, aren't trusted, run from the Internet zone and things like that we'd pay more attention to. Okay. Uh, we also do uh, drop in and do an anti rootkit scan. And on the previous slide, there was a little bullet point in there. I don't know if anybody's heard of Komoku. Anybody? I'll talk a little bit more about that. Basically, they're a kernel anomaly um, detection. And what they do is they look for applications that are hooking and lying to the operating system. So it'll go in and intercept. It'll hook like int 13, and it'll lie to the system about what uh, drivers it has loaded. It might lie about events that are happening on the disk and things like that. So we can actually go pretty deep into the kernel and look for those things that are hooked improperly um, and add those to a detection in the signature and uh, either drop in and do an aggressive scan or, or potentially recommend that you do an offline rootkit scan with a utility that we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, so we've had pretty good luck with uh, some of the newer uh, behavior monitoring signatures. In particular, they've been really great in helping us combat the rogue. So I'm sure you've all seen the rogue AV software out there. It tells you you've got a whole bunch of things wrong with your system, and 
uh, would lead you to believe that your current anti-malware product is now protecting you. And it, it's just bogus. It's a, sort of a social engineering attack of, 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 uh, in some respects. Uh, tricks the user into loading something on the machine that purports to clean it, and it's actually the one that's dropping the malware on the machine. Uh, some of them are even able to connect up to a payment system and, and extract money from the user. And of course, they never deliver on anything that they promise to do. In fact, they've turned the machine into a bot, and the user has paid for that privilege. <laughs> so it's uh, quite a clever system that they've, uh, they've uh, concocted, pretty, pretty clever. Um, we're doing what we can to, to knock these guys back. So one of the things that we turned loose is looking for Zbot back in the first part of March. And um, the volume of the samples that we started getting in, it, it, it hit like in the hundreds the first day of unique files and quickly grew into the you know, higher hundreds a day of new unique samples we were getting. Uh, within a week, the researchers that were actually looking through these, these samples that we detected, remember Randy mentioned we have uh, the malware uh, MMPC, which is our AV analyst group in the company. They actually go through and they look for um, the, the high prevalent threats and they analyze the files. They do it um, with some tools that we have internally to look at behavior. Um, they run the samples in some cases and see what they do and uh, notice where the software drops itself and what sorts of things it, uh, it hooks into the system and so forth. Uh, they found two new ones within the first week of unleashing the signature. And uh, we were the first in the industry to detect, to detect both of these new variants. And they were, they were evil buggers. They dropped a backdoor for a command and control server. They were hooking into the browser to look for, uh, for, to steal your passwords. They were injecting HTML forms into the browser for certain sites like banking sites and things like that, trying to get you to enter your username and password in an unsecure iframe and then, and then transmitting that data back to their server to capture it. Just, uh, just an evil bugger. And then not only that, they would go and uh, try and spread themselves via IM clients, via USB uh, keys and things like that. So uh, great that we, we were able to find these guys. We continue to find new threats on these every day. Uh, one of our more popular behavior monitoring signatures that we've, uh, that we've checked in. So we're kind of just tapping the surface on this technology uh, now that we have all the pieces assembled and are starting to compose these uh, pretty complicated rules to, to find some of these uh, bits of malware. And not all these guys are particularly clever, right? So they, uh, we look for certain things like uh, an auto, auto start that they will write to the registry to um, start themselves up at boot time. And maybe they'll relax some of the security settings on the machine too. So they're not overly clever in how they're doing these sorts of things. Again, a lot of it's social engineering that um, we're able to catch with VM. So another thing we have, Randy mentioned, it's called the Dynamic Signature Service. And what this is, is we release new uh, VDMs every eight hours. But there's also signatures that we'll check in the interim that we can offer you via uh, uh, cloud-based technology. So how this works with behavior monitoring is that we may have a, a signature in DSS. So based on the BM, uh, the BM rule, we can offer you that signature in real time to the client and go ahead and clean up the threat. And that's what my demo is going to show you in a little bit here is, is an example of that. Um, and, and what this does is it just reduces the protection gap between the time that you're either able to onboard those new signatures in your environment um, or, you know, maybe, you know, depending on how often you update your signatures, uh, if you're opted into SpyNet, that's a big thing I need to clarify here. You have to be opted into at least SpyNet Basic to make this DSS thing work because it has to submit the SHA-1 information for the file to our backend service and then be able to match that to a DSS signature and give it back to your client. So how many of you know about SpyNet that, that have FEP? <laughs> Randy, of course, would. Uh, how many of you in your, corporate, in your corporate environment are opted into at least SpyNet Basic? Just kind of curiously, less hands up in the air. So I think part of it, it our uh, job today here and at the booth for sure, is we'd love to have a conversation about what SpyNet does for you, why it's a good thing to turn on at least the SpyNet basic. You're actually enabling a protection feature. It's not just about sending data to Microsoft. And I'd be happy to talk in depth about what it is we send and if there's concerns over um, PII information or things leaking from your company that you don't want, you should follow up with Randy or myself or somebody at the FET booth and we'd love to talk with you about that. Um, because I think it, it, you owe it to your company to look at uh, turning that on, at least for basic.
Okay, so here's where I'm going to show my demo, and hopefully the demo gods are with me today. Uh oh. <laughs> yes. Oh, is it switched to another machine? Oh, got it. Yes. Okay, so what I'm going to show you here is I have a victim machine. Uh, your average happy go lucky user doesn't know the world's full of evil things, right? Uh, but the good news is they're running Microsoft Security Essentials in this case, which, as Randy mentioned, it's the same anti-malware engine as in Forefront Endpoint Protection 2010. Oh, it is FEP. Okay, thank you. Clarif clarification here. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show, looks like we're running a scan. Okay. I'm going to cancel that for a minute here. First, what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you a demo where SpyNet is not enabled on the machine. So this is the configuration option. Uh, it's also, of course, you can set this via policy. So when you deploy FEP, you can set a policy to opt into SpyNet Basic, which I'd encourage you to do. Um, so I've got SpyNet off here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to a web page. Oh, it's easier if I look here. And I'm, I'm going to open this page. You may have seen something like this before. Uh, what it does is it, it attempts to look like a, uh, this is a web page, and actually this is just a screenshot of a web page. But what this guy will do is it'll really spook the user and say, oh my gosh, this is something, it looks like a, a My Computer page, or, or maybe they'll mimic Control Panel or Security Center or something. And they'll say, oh, I have a, I have a problem here. Uh, they use our logo and our security shield and all sorts of other annoying things. They also mimic other third-party AVs. You may have seen some of those. And uh, so this, this can really vary. Uh, Randy and I were able to find like four or five of this identical site last night with a minimal amount of searching. So there's literally these sites come and go within 10 or 15 minutes, and then they stand up a new one using the exact same code, the exact same screenshots, et cetera. So what the user does is they click on Remove All, and what will happen is it's connected to a, an application. So it will download the application on the machine. The user will run it, say, oh, great, you know, the security product's really going to save my bacon. I've got all these threats. Um, they'll go ahead and install it. And what's going to happen here is it's going to elevate. What's going to happen in the background is behavior monitoring is looking at all these actions going on, right? So it's looking at file-based events. It's looking for registry events and so forth, and it's going to look for a pattern of behavior. And what this one is, is doing is it's disabling uh, UAC. So I'm going to go ahead and install it. It's good security 2011, so it's current, right? It's good stuff. Uh, my installer is actually smart enough. It's, it's uh, elevated. It's asked for admin privilege. So when the user runs this application after it's done with setup, it already has full control of the machine. So it can do really whatever it wants. It can drop a root kit. In this case, it's relatively benign turning off UAC, but normally they would also drop a whole bunch of other stuff on, uh, behind this with the installer uh, when the machine goes. So I'm going to run it. This is my clever attempt at UI and why I don't write software at Microsoft. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and scan now. This is great. This is really going to protect me, right? So I'm feeling good. they got a lock icon and the whole nine yards. So this is great. So, oh, I didn't find any threats, so it must have done whatever I need to do. Normally, it would show you that it cleaned up a bunch of things and so forth, right? I'm, I'm just a lazy programmer, so that's, that's as far as I took it. Uh, but let me show you what's happened here. So we've got a couple of things that have happened in our event log, and that's going to be in here. Oh, that's never mind. So we have this MPA event log file. Roll down to the bottom. Okay, so what's happened here is you'll notice the time is 7.43. This is actually the um, BM signature that it matched on. And uh, what will happen is that if I had SpyNet enabled, which I don't, it would send this hash of this file up to the back end. It would match on a DSS signature, and it would give it to the client and protect you against the threat. Now, it's run on the machine, so I just want to be clear, behavior monitoring is not a blocking technology. It's, uh, I, I look for things, it's sort of like I copy things over to the side, fill a queue up, and I look at it, and then I'll clean up if I can later. Okay, so SpyNet disabled bad. My, my thing is run. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, uh, it's going to drop a, a rootkit. The 
evil iCar on my machine, if you know what iCar is. And I think I'll close this really quick. Um, so the other thing really quick here while I have this open, this is where the um, dynamic signature service is going to drop files. So you can see right now it's empty. When I bring this back up after I drop the evil, evil spy program, uh, you'll see that uh, signature was delivered. So let me start by turning on SpyNet. Back in settings. I'll opt into basic. Okay, good. I'm, I'm feeling better now already. Okay, so this is going to go really quick, but what I'll do is I'll show you the behavior monitoring log so you see the detection, and then I'll show you the signature. What you'll, what you'll notice here is um, security essentials will go to red because it'll, it'll see the known dropped malware, which is the evil iCar. And then what'll happen is we'll see another detection pop because the dynamic signature service has provided us the new SIG, so it will, it will clean the threat, the other one as well. So it will not only clean the, the installer, but it will uh, clean up the dropped files as well. So if you had uh, SpyNet disabled, it would only clean up the installer. That's the first detection that'll, that'll match on. So okay, it's gonna be really quick. Bang, it's done. So let's look down here. Ah. So let me go to the data folder. Oh, it's already here, great. So you can see I went from one potential thread. It was really quick. If you, if you didn't see it, uh, look for it on the rebroadcast that will be available for download in a few days. Uh, we actually detected one threat, and then we went ahead and detected the second one. So if I look at show details, uh, this is just a test file. The dropper and then the virus that I infected the machine with is iCar. We'll just use that for test purposes. You're probably mostly familiar with that. So I'm going to apply the recommended actions, and I'm just going to remove the threat. Okay, great. So let's look at our uh, support log again, and then we'll notice that there is a behavior monitoring event, and um, then there we should see a SpyNet as well. Whoops. Okay, so here, what we see is we see this behavior Win32 drop known malware. So that's the behavior monitoring uh, rule that I matched on, right? And then down below here, I can see that, uh, let me do a control one. I'm going to come back down here, and I'm going to see this dynamic, uh, dynamic signature service right there. Signature uh, update and received is what I'm seeing. And then down below is the actual uh, cleaning of the, of the threats. Okay, so we're good here. We're back to green, user's happy, and the world is safe from uh, this particular threat again. Okay, so let me switch back over to my PowerPoint slide. Okay, great. So my next second favorite topic, uh, almost as uh, favorite to me as uh, behavior monitoring, is the anti rootkit stuff. Um, I just want to draw attention to the bottom right here, because this uh, kind of represents a gut check for for Microsoft as a company a few years back. Uh, when we released FCS, um, our rootkit detection rates and removal rates weren't uh, the best in the industry, we'll say. And so what we see in the bottom right there is uh, Andreas runs a site called avtest.org. You may have heard of it. Uh, what he does is he does some, some testing on anti-malware products and looks for things like rootkits and uh, unknown um, malware and things like that and then publishes based on his testing, what the detection and removal rates are. So um, in 2001, we could detect quite a few inactive rootkits. Um, our detective, detection rate for active ones was not as good, and our removal rate was, frankly, pretty poor. So we made a lot of investments. We uh, acquired some technology from the company I mentioned called Komoku. But we also invested in some other things here with um, the uh, reboot tracking. So what we can do is we can actually start ourselves up early in the reboot process and unhook um, rootkits that formerly would have beat us in the boot path to load. So before we couldn't knock them out because they were loaded before us, 
and um, running in, in kernel mode, and we had no chance to unhook them. So with uh, some of the things we've done there with KBTR, we can actually get ahead of them and, uh, and clean them off the machine. Uh, we also have done some things. How many have heard of the diagnostic scan or standalone system sweeper or MS Dart or any of those sorts of things? A few hands in the room. So if, you've, uh, if you have MDOP or if you have CoreCal, you already have a license to what we call the standalone system sweeper. And what it is, it's bootable media, so it's, it's trusted good media that, that isn't infected. And we can reboot with this thing. Uh, it loads uh, WinPE and then has a set of tools that you can run on the machine and do various things. One of them is the standalone system sweeper. And that's basically an automated root, root kit removal tool that uh, you can boot into and, and clean the machi uh, machine. So for some of the really nasty bits of malware out there, rootkits out there, uh, that's a good option for you to be able to, to salvage the box. I had another quick question. So if, if, when you find malware on users' machines, how many of you just wipe the machine by default as a rea reaction? How many try to clean? Try to clean. Does it depend on the type of threat you detect sometimes? OK, I see a few heads nodding. It's kind of an interesting, um, interesting observation. We, we see uh, you know, a couple different camps of, of people and, and corporations more, more uh, accurately what their security policy is when they detect threats. And it may depend on the user's machine. Like if they're a help desk person, you might just wipe and pay. If it's a, if it's a VP, you might try to, to clean it. And that's where some of these uh, investments here that we've made in the, in the tool like San, uh, System Sweeper will uh, give you another thing in your rootkit combat uh, arsenal. OK, so some of the things we've invested in are, uh, like I mentioned, the KBTR, the kernel boot time removal, lets us get in early. Uh, we can also do some raw parsing of the disk and, uh, and look for hidden threats there as well. And there's a lot of, lot of rootkits that like to hide themselves on the file system and, and not show up. So we can actually uncover these guys and, uh, and knock them off the machine. Uh, and as I mentioned at the bottom there, the, the diagnostic scan, uh, I'm sorry, the standalone system sweeper is one of our removal tools. One of our other things we've done is uh, diagnostic scan is basically uh, intelligence built around how we scan. So the old school way of thought is just scan the entire hard drive every single time apply no um, intelligence to behind the resources that we're going to go look at. And that's fine when disks are, are small and there's not a lot of uh, data on the machine. But when you have two terabyte drives and dozens of applications installed and data and all these sorts of things, it's, uh, it's a pretty big problem to go out and actually touch every file and scan it. It's not very efficient. It's not the best way to find malware because they hide in, in fairly consistent places. And if your machine has been patched, your AV's been up and running the whole time, um, there's a good chance that we can reduce that burden of scanning on your machine by applying some intelligence to it. So um, that's what we've done with the diagnostic scan, and I'll, I'll show you a demo of that in, in just a few minutes. Uh, some of the other things we're doing with KSL is our kernel support library, is we're actually working to move that into more of a signature-based approach, just like behavior monitoring. So next tech ed, we'll be able to show you all kinds of cool stuff around that, uh, but just plant that in your back of your brain. OK, so back to diagnostic scan here. It's, uh, Randy has a phrase for it, and it's escaping me right now. Smart. It's smart. OK, great. <laughs> OK, so again, some of the things that we look for, if, if real-time protection has been enabled the whole time, then we'll do less scanning. Um, the other things we do is we do some caching. And we look for things like um, uh, sign files and things like that. We'll add those to what we call MOAC, the mother of all caches, so that we'll omit those from scanning next time around that you, that you run either a quick scan or a full scan. Now, we do have some revocation logic in there before you say, but Jason, if you cache it and it goes rogue on me, what do you do? Well, if a file's changed and it's gone rogue, number one, it's got a different SHA-1 to it. And, uh, and number two, we have eviction logic. So we'll, we'll toss it out of the, queue, uh, the cache. And we'll scan it next time and, and pick up the threat. Uh, but we've really spent a lot of time, like Randy mentioned, being um, at least intrusive on the machine as possible, lowering our memory footprint, running as a low, uh, low priority I.O. tasks on the machine, so that we really want to get out of the way while still providing great protection for the user. And hopefully you're seeing that in the product if you're using it today. 
Okay, so um, diagnostic scan, or these are the different things that it can look at. And again, depending on the security posture of the machine, will adjust and either add elements to the scan or pull some things out of the scan. And I'll show you a quick demo. It's a little cheesy, but, but basically uh, we're going to run a, a quick scan. We'll see how long it takes. Uh, we'll run it again, and I'll show you the second time around after it's built the cache uh, how quick it runs. And then what I'll do is I'll turn the real-time protection off. So again here, when we, when we um, look at real-time protection as an indicator of uh, potential risk for the machine, we think turning RTP off is a pretty high risk factor because that's our... Um, always looking at, at things that are being dropped on the file system or, or executed on the file system. That's how we, we're going to catch uh, most of the things that we do outside of the, the scanning window. Okay, so we'll go to our happy user again. And... I'll do is I'll pull up FAP. It's already running. And I'm going to do a quick scan. Now, this is running in Hyper-V, so it's um, a little bit slower than it might run on metal otherwise. Uh, pay attention, though, on the bottom here. What you want to look at is you want to look at the number of items scanned is really what I want to show here. Oops, this looks like it freezes it. And you can see it's looking through some of the registry keys. It's looking at uh, some of the... Oh, what did I find? Oh, this is our Trojan dropper that's copied in another file. Remember the demo that I did earlier where it quick ran? That file's actually copied to another location. So it, now the quick scan picked up that one. I actually didn't run it from that location. I ran it from another, another copy of it in the demo folder. I'll, I'll clean it really quick. Okay. We'll close that. So we scanned uh, 20,000 items. We found a threat, which is great. I'm going to run it again really quick here. And we should see that uh, count being reduced and the scan going a little bit quicker. There are certain things we're always going to scan no matter what in some of the Windows system folders and things like that. We do want to scan those. But look at that number. It went down to 25% of the former um, uh, scanning footprint that we did before. And that's uh, 6,000 objects, so those include things like registry keys and things like that. Those aren't just files, um, just to be clear. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to turn off real-time protection. That is going to turn Security Center red on me and... Ah, so that's bad, right? So now what I'm going to do is I'll turn this back on. Remember, we had 6,000 or so objects scanned. I'm going to run a quick scan again. And I should see that number go back more probably in the 20,000 range um, because the machine was not unsecured for some period of time. It could be two seconds. It could be 20 days. We don't really differentiate. We just know RTP was turned off. And that is our first line of defense. Okay, exciting stuff. So hopefully you know a little bit more about rootkits, a little bit more about behavior monitoring, and then let me see what else I've got here in store for you. I, I mentioned this before, the reboot tracking, uh, so that we know we can get ahead of some of the more advanced root kits and remediate them out of the box. What you're looking at on the right here is actually the FEP console showing uh, a threat detection. And in the little tiny print here, I can't seem to do a control I and zoom in. Whoops. No, that's not good. So down here, what you, this, uh, this would essentially, what you would notice in a corporate environment, you would see the uh, run anti, or, sorry, run anti-malware standalone system sweeper. Remember I mentioned that comes with uh, the, uh, we call it Callisto internally, or MS Dart, the, the uh, data recovery tools. And you would boot from that, run the standalone system sweeper, and uh, knock that rootkit off the machine. So that, that's what we're showing here. Um, there's some other things you can do with MS Dart. Uh, you can put that on a RIS server so that you can boot from the network. You don't have to walk around with the CD. And you could potentially walk the user through that on the phone or something if, if you wanted to instead of dispatch somebody to go attend to their machine. 
So there's some options there. It's, it's not, uh, you can't go search and find for uh, documentation on that, but uh, Randy and I will work on getting that documented so that you have some guidance on how to make that uh, available in your environment from the network. Okay, so I am out of time, and I'm going to turn it back over to Randy. His favorite topic, NIS. Great. Thanks, Jason. All right, so hopefully everybody's uh, uh, excited about some of that stuff. You know, the, uh, uh, as we mentioned before, the you know, behavior monitoring, and you know, this is really about when these new threats hit the wild, how do we find out about them. We're kind of back into... Uh, uh, the protection, you know, how do we block systems from getting infected to begin with uh, when we talk about NIST. So NIST is our, uh, you know, addresses one of the protection gaps that we actually had in forefront client security. So in forefront client security, all of our real-time protection uh, was file system based. So we had that file system mini filter, um, you know, when Jason went uh, for the diagnostic scan demo and disabled uh, real-time protection. In, in forefront client security, when you do that, you're pretty much turning off that mini filter that's doing the disk uh, access inspection and making sure uh, anytime anything on disk is accessed, hey, is it malicious or not, or, or do I let it go ahead and be executed? Um, and that's great, and that's sort of the core real-time protection technology that anti-malware has had for years. Um, but there are certain classes of attacks, especially with vulnerability exploits, where nothing ever hits the disk. And uh, the Conficker worm, which came out a few years ago, uh, anybody here have you know, experience with uh, the Conficker worm? Yep, see uh, several people, right? So it was, it was a pretty bad one. Um, and unfortunately, if you're running forefront client security, we weren't able to block it uh, if it was coming in through this uh, network attack vector. So if the machine uh, was unpatched against this you know, MS-08067 uh, was the, the security bulletin, if the machine had that vulnerability, uh, you could exploit it uh, simply by sending this malicious packet uh, to the machine. Uh, and then that malicious packet would, uh, you know, exploited this flaw in uh, SMB in Windows, and then the attacker was able to run this arbitrary code. So in order to protect against that, and, and that's without anything ever hitting the disk, so our, our mini filter couldn't intercept that. Um, so what we've done is created a uh, network inspection capability. Um, if you're familiar with HIPS type uh, products, so host-based intrusion prevention, uh, this is a technology that's been around uh, in other products for a while. But uh, HIPS is, you know, tends to be very heavyweight. Um, so you know, if you're inspect constantly inspecting all the traffic, you're paying kind of a big performance penalty. Uh, we tried to be a little bit smarter again, back to that idea of operationalizing security. Uh, we tried to be a little bit smarter with NIST. Um, where we're, we're essentially only doing inspection if the machine is vulnerable. So if the machine is missing a patch for something that we have a, you know, a signature on, uh, then we'll go ahead and activate um, this scanning technology and do the uh, traffic interception. So if you have that uh, Conficker you know, vulnerability uh, unpatched on your machine, we'll turn on scanning for SMB traffic uh, using the Windows filtering platform that's available uh, in Vista. Uh, and, and above. So this is a technology that, you know, it's available in FAP. It doesn't work on XP because we, we do rely on that uh, Windows filtering platform uh, capability. Um, but that performance optimization is really important. So we're, you know, making sure that uh, when we, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're only on when we need to be. So when we're doing that inspection, it's because that machine is actually uh, uh, at risk of getting infected by one of these vulnerabilities. Um, so what I want to do is go ahead and uh, show you this in action. And uh, just kind of, uh, we'll go back to this uh, uh, machine that Jason was demoing on. And uh, the, uh, let me see. First thing I want to show you is, you'll see in real-time protection, there's a couple of new uh, uh, options there. So Jason showed you behavior monitoring, so it's now an option in real-time protection. And then you also see this uh, network inspection system uh, feature that you can turn on and off. Um, they're both on. Let me show you the NIST log. So one thing that, uh, so this is a log that we have. It's in that program data folder. And what you can see in here is that uh, this is a list of all the signatures. And you can see, uh, if we look over here, it'll tell you which ones are off and which ones are on. So uh, the signatures are off. That means these signatures do not apply to this machine. Uh, the signatures that are on means that, oh, hey, this machine is actually vulnerable to this particular exploit. It's missing this patch. Therefore, we're going to turn that signature on. Uh, so this, I'm actually running on a Vista system uh, that's nice and uh, vulnerable uh, because it hasn't been patched at all. 
So you can see uh, it has seven enabled signatures. And really what that means is it has seven vulnerabilities that it needs to be patched for. So it's missing seven patches. Um, so uh, what we're doing then is saying, okay, any of these, uh, and on this case there's I think one RPC vulnerability and like six uh, SMB vulnerabilities. So any RPC traffic, any SMB traffic to this machine, uh, NIST is going to be inspecting and making sure that none of that traffic uh, is malicious. If any exploit of that vulnerability comes across, uh, we'll block it and prevent the user from getting infected. Uh, so I'll go ahead and show you that. The, uh, uh, what I have here is this is the bad guy machine, this is uh, the attacker, and what he's going to do is we're going to actually go ahead and try and uh, exploit uh, one of these active vulnerabilities that are on this machine. So you can see here I've got a, uh, a little bit of shell code. So this is just a simple Python script that uh, exploits uh, MS10054. So that's one of the uh, SMB vulnerabilities that this guy is not patched against. And what we're going to try and do with this vulnerability, you can see I basically just have this uh, sort of evil uh, uh, buffer that I'm going to send to uh, uh, that machine. Uh, that's the IP address for, for our, our happy user machine over there. Um, I'm just going to send this on port 445, which is the SMB port. Um, and what we're going to try and do is just crash the machine. So this particular vulnerability, uh, this MS10054, is a remote code execution vulnerability. So if we wanted to, we could run arbitrary code, install a rootkit, uh, run basically whatever we want without elevating. Um, you know, we're going to exploit that vulner vulnerability. Uh, for my purposes, we're going to keep things simple and just try and uh, uh, crash the machine. So let's go ahead and run the attack. And, hmm, nothing seems to have happened. Well, that's good. That's because NIST is enabled, um, and so we, we should have blocked the attack. So for NIST detections, uh, we don't actually surface anything to the user. We block them. There's, uh, we block the attack. There's nothing for the user to do. Uh, we do log it in the event log. Um, the, the, you know, if you think of a machine that's basically sitting on your network, and if you have an infected machine that's sending out, you know, spamming IP traffic, you wouldn't want the uh, uh, users getting nagged. Uh, but we do... Uh, log this in the event log. So let's go ahead and so we should see an event now for uh, NIST blocking uh, this attack. So what we see here, uh, 806, which was right now, um, you can see here's that uh, NIST detection event. So let's drill into this a little bit. Um, so this is our, our basic detection event. We use the same event ID 1116, so it's um, you know like any of our regular anti-malware events. But a few things you'll notice are different. So one, uh, you know, you can see from the detection name that it's a vulnerability detection. Uh, we detected an exploit of a vulner an attempted exploit of a vulnerability. Uh, you can see uh, it's a Windows vulnerability, uh, SMB2. So this is a vulnerability in SMB2. And then that uh, identifier on the end there, that Bang 2009 3103, that's the uh, common vulnerabilities and exposures, or CVE ID, if you're familiar with how we do, um, uh, how vulnerabilities are tracked, um, that was attempted uh, to, be, to be exploited. If you look at the path, we're kind of reusing the path in an interesting way. So you'll see that first IP address. That's actually the IP address of the attacker machine. So we log uh, where did this attack come from. And then you can see the, the uh, destination machine. So that was this machine. Uh, came in on port 445. And again, it was using the SMB protocol. Uh, we do block outbound traffic as well. So if you have a machine that's uh, infected and is trying to send out uh, uh, malicious traffic, we'll block that and protect other machines on your network. Um, and uh, uh, you can see in this case it was an inbound attack. Okay, so that's uh, kind of NIST in action. Um, blocked the, the attack. What I'm gonna do now though is actually turn off NIST and uh, rerun the attack just to show you what happens if NIST isn't there. Um, I'm gonna save changes. So NIST is now off. Um, so let's go ahead and go back to this guy and rerun the attack and see what, uh, uh, see what happens. Oh, and there's the exploit. So we, in this case the machine got, uh, we crashed the machine, we were able to exploit that vulnerability without NIST there doing that SMB traffic inspection and blocking the attack on the machine's vulnerable. And again, we could have executed you know, arbitrary code on this machine with that vulnerability. In this case, we just decided uh, to go ahead and, and crash the machine. So that is the NIST demo. Um, one thing I want to mention about uh, what we just saw with NIST is that uh, again, if that machine was patched, uh, NIST would have been completely off and not causing any kind of performance uh, you know, penalty to the machine. Uh, NIST is not an alternative to patching, right? So you know, we, we're, we're shipping NIST signatures not for every vulnerability that's out there. Uh, we're really looking for, hey, any, any of these non-file-based, uh, network-specific attacks that are coming in, 
uh, we'll ship a signature for. We ship, you know, one signature, uh, MS, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, MS10054, which I kept mentioning, we just shipped a signature for, but I actually did a demo with a different uh, vulnerability, MS09059, uh, I think. Um, but anyway, so, you know, we're, we're shipping signatures, but you, you definitely don't want to rely on this as a patching, uh, as an alternative to patching. So make sure you patch your machines, and then this doesn't even need to be there. Uh, it's really only there for, you know, those cases where the machine isn't patched. You know, it provides that zero-day protection. If there's some zero-day that comes out, there's not a patch available yet, NIST can be there and, and protect those machines from getting infected until the patch is available. Yeah? There's really, there's really, so the question was, uh, so if I keep my machines patched, should I disable this? Um, and, uh, you know, is there a performance hit just from having it enabled? And there's really not, so that's what we, we optimize for. Um, the, you know, the NIST service will still be running, uh, checking to see if, uh, you know, hey, are there any active signatures periodically? Do I need to, to activate? Uh, but if the machines are fully patched, you could turn off NIST, and, you know, really the only thing that it's doing is if that zero day comes out and we ship a new NIST signature, and there's no patch available, then it's already on and available and we'll start protecting that machine. If some zero day comes out and there's no patch available, you'd have to go turn on this if you have it disabled in order to make sure those machines are getting protected. So our recommendation would be, you know, if, if just that, you know, extra two megabytes, I think, which is what the service takes, you know, you're running in a virtualized environment. I'll talk about VDI in a little bit. And so like in a VDI, you know, pooled server or pooled desktop type, uh, uh, scenario, you, you might want to turn off NIST just to minimize the, you know, um, the processes that are running and things. But it should be, there, there's no network traffic hit at all, but you do have that, you know, at least that service still running. Uh, I do want to put in a plug for, you know, the Microsoft Malware Protection Center. So Jason and I are here, we're talking about kind of all these great technology improvements we've made, uh, but they're really worthless without the work that these guys do. So this is the team that actually takes what we do and then writes the signatures, analyzes the malware, does all that you know, disassembly, uh, writes the kind of automation rules for things like these uh, behavior monitoring signatures that, that Jason talked about um, to make sure that we're staying up on top of, of the latest threats when they come out. So they're kind of our you know, uh, close partners. Uh, we work really closely with them and make sure that we're giving them uh, the capabilities they need in the anti-malware platform and in the engine so that they can actually write the detection rules and the heuristics and, and generic signatures and everything uh, to detect those new threats when they come out. Uh, if you're a FEP customer, they, they, you know, they do a lot for you guys in terms of if you have uh, samples that you find on your network or things that look suspicious and you want to submit them in, uh, if there was uh, you know, something that, that you think is a new threat that we don't have detection for, uh, please go to Microsoft.com MMPC, submit those. You can log in with your Windows Live ID. Uh, you can see a list of your previous submissions. You can see what the status is. Um, if you're an enterprise customer, you can uh, enter your uh, ID for that there, and then you can actually submit a high pry, which will page somebody, make sure somebody, you know, uh, hops on uh, that right away. Um, all FEP submissions get pretty high priority, but if you're that enterprise customer, they'll, they'll give that, you know, put it right at the top of the uh, stack for analysis. And they, uh, uh, you know, MMPC is uh, globally, you know, 24-7 distributed across the world. We have sites in Melbourne and Japan and Dublin, uh, as well as here in, uh, in the U.S., um, and they're just constantly on top of all the new stuff coming out. Uh, I, I will also say the Microsoft uh, Security Intelligence Report was just released this last week. I would encourage anybody who has any interest in sort of the threat landscape and what's going on and trends in uh, vulnerabilities and, as well as malware, uh, go read the SIR. It's, uh, uh, it's a nice, you know, you, a lot of graphs and pictures and data. Um, it's a, actually a pretty quick read if you, if you kind of go through it and you can get a real feel for what, uh, uh, what's going on out in the... Uh, what the latest trends are. And that just came out, and this is the, these are the guys that, that put that out. Uh, so just to kind of summarize what the, uh, uh, you know, some of the things that we've, we've talked about in terms of, of the protection stack, you know, we're, we're again uh, looking for that real-time protection. What are those gaps that we can, uh, we can close with things like NIST, uh, where we have, you know, gaps in protection. Hey, here's the new technology investment we need to, to make uh, in order to, to close that gap and really have uh, that, that next level of protection. Um, and then for the things that we don't detect, you know, the malware authors are, are really good at, at trying to uh, foil our, our detection. So they'll do things like uh, submit, you know, the samples to VirusTotal, keep tweaking it until they get a version that none of the major AV vendors will detect. If you're not familiar with VirusTotal, it's a site where you can submit a file and see uh, what all, you know, 40 different antivirus scanners that they have in there detected as. It's actually interesting. I was just reading the Allurion 
uh, rootkit authors, um, they actually have in their contract, uh, again, this is a business for these guys, right? But in, they have contracts with their uh, customers that they sell the Alurion rootkit to uh, that says, you, you must, you know, we'll fine you if you submit uh, uh, our samples to VirusTotal. We have our own uh, test bed that we use for testing all these scanners. So uh, these guys are pretty, uh, uh, pretty sophisticated in trying to figure out, you know, how do they get that thing out there uh, that we can't detect, that uh, the other uh, antivirus vendors can't detect. So those things do, you know, they get out there and, and again, we have, you know, a lot of great stuff to, so that we can find those as fast as possible, get that insight into, hey, there's a new threat spreading in the wild, get that sample back, get that signature turned around uh, through a lot of the automation and, and things we have on the back end. And then once we have that signature, how can we get that to the customer faster? So that's where that dynamic signature service comes in. You know, uh, new signature gets created on the back end, it might be eight hours before it's going to actually uh, get published. Uh, out and, and land on you know your your uh, desktops if they're only checking you know once a day for signature updates uh, we publish three times a day so there's at least that you know potential eight hour window so it can be a long time before they're actually going to get that update with the dynamic signature service if we see signs of that you know infection that threat uh, on the system we'll deliver that immediately in real time like Jason uh, uh, demoed. Um, I, so I did I did mention VDI. I do want to talk a little bit about VDI. Uh, it's it's a little bit off topic for this talk, but we keep getting asked about it. What are your recommendations for running in virtualized environments? What are your recommendations if we're deploying VDI? Um, have you guys looked at that? And, and so I just wanted to uh, at least give some some guidance around that. So uh, in general, uh, you know, our guidance today, if you're running a virtual machine versus running on bare metal, is you still want you know that full protection. You want that capability. Um, you shouldn't treat a virtual machine necessarily differently than you would a, a regular machine. Uh, we're looking at how do we optimize uh, for, the, for you know, being in a VM, are there things we can do to really, um, uh, in, in the next version of the platform, make it you know, uh, virtualization aware and, and do some uh, uh, smarter things there in terms of performance. But right now, our, our primary recommendation is definitely run, run you know, in the VM uh, the same way you would run on bare metal. But there are some, you know, specific virtualization scenarios like, v like VDI, and specifically if you're running like a pooled desktop, uh, a pooled VDI environment where, you know, your workers come in, there's this blessed image that's known to be good, it's known to be clean, they're going to get that for that work day, and then at the end of the day it's going to get recycled and thrown away. Uh, yeah, in those cases there are some things you can do to, um, uh, you know, some optimizations you can do because of the life cycle of that operating system. I mean, it's really the equivalent of installing a brand new operating system every morning. Um, so you don't necessarily need a network inspection system turned on if, if, as long as you know that, the, you know, that image is in a good state, is fully patched and things like that. So we do have some recommendations uh, in that case. One is definitely you want to run a full scan. This is the best thing you can do in that uh, image before it gets deployed. Uh, and this is where our caching and, and a lot of the optimizations that we do on that first scan uh, happen. Pre-building that cache and having everything in that image already having been scanned and, and in our cache, that, that's going to be a big uh, performance improvement. Uh, so definitely before you deploy the image, uh, put FEP in there, get that uh, full scan run, and that, that's going to be the, the number one thing you'll want to make sure you do. If at all possible, update the signatures in the base image as frequently as possible. I mean, our, our recommendation would be if you can you know, have some lightweight update process. I know people don't like to update, you know, the base image. I mean, might get updated once a month or something on a patch cycle. Uh, if you can do signature updates more frequently, like daily or, or you know, even uh, uh, weekly, something like that, that would be great. Uh, again, because when you roll, rolled out that image, uh, if the signatures in that image are, are stale, they're two weeks old now, uh, those clients are going to want to go and try and get new signatures. They're also going to be potentially unprotected if they have old signatures. Uh, so if you can do that, uh, that's great. If you can't, uh, one thing you do want to make sure is that leave the signature update randomization setting. This is a policy setting. Uh, it's on by default, so you shouldn't have to actually do anything here, but don't turn it off. That's going to prevent those resource storm type cases where all the machines try and uh, go get signature updates at the same time. Uh, we have a built-in randomization window, so within 30 minutes before or after the signature update interval, uh, we'll go and, um, uh, and get those updates, and that'll keep all, those, uh, all the VMs from, from hitting at the same time. Uh, same thing with scanning. You can probably, if you're in a pooled environment, the machine's only going to be out there for, you know, a day. You can turn off scheduled scan. There's not really a need if you trust the base image to scan, you know, run that scheduled scan. We do have a lot of optimizations for the scheduled scan. We do CPU throttles, uh, throttling um, and, and some other things, and also scheduled scan randomization. So we're, we're, for scheduled scans, we're within an hour of that uh, scheduled scan window when it will actually run. 
as you saw when Jason ran the scan, I mean, it, it's pretty quick. You know, uh, if everything's good in the machine with the diagnostic scan, it'll, you know, it'll scan in a few seconds. Yeah, question. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I'm not, it's not my recommendation. So I know our, you know, the, the FEP team worked with a bunch of the server workload, all the different, uh, and, and they came up with some policy recommendations. I think from the protection side, I mean, we would like to have, say, hey, you should enable the scheduled scan, but it's sort of like, I, I think they decided, hey, we should, you know, we're gonna optimize for performance and, and be a little, a little heavier on that side. Um, so it's kind of up to you. It depends on what the workload is. And, you know, if real-time protection is on and the machine's getting updated, you know, and, and that's, that's the key protection piece. The scheduled scan is, is less important. It's really that, well, if you got something in there that, you know, we missed on real-time, and if it's something that's really nefarious, like a root kit that we're not, you know, we're not going to see, like real-time protection, we'll, you know, when the engine loads up, we get a signature update, we'll scan processes. And so if there's something running, we should catch it. But if it's a root kit that's, you know, really kind of buried itself and hooked the kernel, uh, things like that, um, you might want to have that scheduled scan to detect that active threat. So would you recommend a full scan schedule or a quick scan? Quick scan. So quick scan is really, uh, so full scan is if there's malware lying around on the machine and we want to find it, run a full scan, right? Quick scan is really designed, and especially with this diagnostic scan intelligence that we've built in, to find any active threat on the system. So anything that's actively running and doing anything bad uh, that's, you know, in memory or, or active uh, that can be started automatically through one of those auto start execution points. That's what quick scan is, is designed for. Full scan is, hey, there might be some, you know, zip file with some malware buried in it that a user could get to and click on. We want to find that in the full scan. We'll scan everything. So it's the exhaustive scan. Full scan is kind of, in my opinion, I mean, it's, it's like, hey, we just want to make sure this thing is absolutely uh, clean. But it's not, it's not really going to add additional, you know, hey, we're going to find something that, that's actively infected. So full scans are good, but they're, they're, they're kind of the sledgehammer, right? I mean, if you really want that, you know, uh, guaranteed certificate of health, yeah, run the full scan. But if you're worried, hey, I just want to make sure the machine's not actually infected and, you know, there's not something running trying to steal passwords or do something bad or infect other machines, uh, quick scan should be sufficient for that. So if you have real-time protection enabled, uh, real-time protection will should catch that. Yeah, if maybe through a signature update it was something there. Yeah, doing a full scan on, on that file. We actually have a command line, the MPCMD run command line tool. Um, a lot of people are building for their file servers uh, solutions that use that because you can basically do file, single file scanning with that. And so they'll have like, as part of the, when a user uploads a file, they'll, they'll kick off a quick, you know, they'll scan that any new files coming in and things like that. But yeah, if, for a file server, if that's, you know, just want to scan everything, make sure there's no malware out there that users can get at, um, a full scan would be, would be a good choice for that scenario. Um, yeah, so you can, you know, if it's this pooled VDI, you know, we're, we're more comfortable turning off some of those protection features, like behavior monitoring, uh, like NIST, if you, if you trust that base image. Uh, so some basic recommendations. Um, uh, uh, for VDI, if you have questions, come by the booth and we, we can talk more about it. So uh, one thing that got announced yesterday and I'm excited to uh, uh, talk about is the beta of FEP 2012 is now available. Um, so the stuff we work on, you know, that we've talked about, there's, it's pretty much the same protection capabilities. Uh, really FEP 2012 is about uh, uh, integrating with System Center Configuration Manager uh, 2012 and getting that, uh, uh, some of the improvements they have there uh, working with FEP. So uh, go check that out. Um, they have real-time, uh, a much faster kind of reporting channel. So this issue that you have maybe in FEP 2010 where, you know, uh, to really get a sense of, oh, there's some kind of outbreak on my network. You know, with System Center, there's, there's sort of a delay right now. It can be maybe 30 minutes before you get that report that, oh, hey, this machine, you know, had an infection or had a cleaning failure. Uh, that, that channel is, is really fast now in, in FEP 2012. That was one of the main requests I know we had uh, with FEP 2010 and, and System Center. So uh, anyway, go, go download it, uh, play with it. If you haven't played with the new version of System Center, it's, it's uh, uh, hopefully coming out uh, in the next few months and then, uh, or in the next, sometime in the next year, I guess. Um, hopefully by end of year, I think. Um, go uh, uh, get the beta, install FEP, uh, FEP on it and, and see some of the improvements they made there. 
Uh, I just wanted to point out, if you stop by the FEP booth and you find a guy named David there, he actually has a FEP 2012 um, beta environment that he can show you uh, and, and walk through how he set it up and configured it. So stop by the booth, look for a guy named David, and uh, he'll hook you up. And then uh, there are some other great talks. Uh, these are in the deck. Um, you should go check out some of these resources. Um, other great resources, of course. Oh, yes, and please fill out evaluations and uh, uh, tell everybody how much you loved our talk or didn't, as the case may be. Um, and that's it. I think we have about five minutes left for questions. So any questions? Yep. Okay, so the question was, what are the additional benefits for the advanced versus the basic SpyNet? So basic SpyNet versus advanced SpyNet really depends on the information that's getting sent into telemetry to Microsoft. Uh, so we use things, so advanced SpyNet gives us more information. So there's benefit to us directly because we get more information. For example, the path uh, where the malware ex executable was seen or the suspicious file was seen. In basic, we don't send that because, well, there might be a username in the path. So basic, we don't send any personally potentially personally identifiable information. That's why we encourage everybody to turn on basic. Advanced, there is some, you know, I mean, it's very minimal, but things like, oh, username might be in the path. We only send that in advance. Um, so, but that's useful for us because then we can see things like, oh, hey, here's some paths that are really commonly used, um, like uh, uh, the user temp path was one that we found uh, through looking at the data that we do get from advanced users is a very common place for where rootkits were getting installed. Uh, we have like this raw disk scanning that Jason talked about. We said, oh, maybe in our default scan, we should add that you know, user temp folder to our raw disk scanning. You know, we try and avoid adding too many folders for performance reasons, but you know, that's the kind of intelligence that we get. Of course, that benefits us directly. It benefits you sort of more indirectly, um, but it increases the protection capability of FEP. So the more people we get uh, opting into advanced, the better telemetry we're going to get and the more threats we're, you know, the better the, the protection is going to be. I think but there's no real direct like, oh, hey, you know, with basic you get dynamic signature service capability. With advanced you get some other feature. Uh, it's really, you know, any of the SpyNet options you'll get, you'll get the protection capability. Yep, in the back. So earlier you had said that uh, NIST protects from outlaws as well, correct? Yes. It should, right? Uh, but you could have a scenario where the machine's infected with something that we're not able to detect, for example. Uh, so say we don't have a signature on that particular threat yet, which hopefully we won't. So hopefully this is a scenario that doesn't come up very often. But if we didn't have that actual signature, the, the thing with NIST is that NIST is detecting any, vulner any exploit of that vulnerability. It's very, very generic. So it doesn't matter what file it is, what threat. I mean, you could write your own, you know, uh, script, as long as it's, it's you know, sending something that's trying to exploit that vulnerability, NIST will detect and block it. Um, so that's, that's why NIST, you know, if you have outbound threats, I mean, there's, there's other you know, scenarios you can think of where that would happen. But yeah, if real-time protection is you know, enabled, um, then hopefully real-time protection is going to prevent that machine from getting infected to begin with. But if for some reason it was infected, NIST would still block that uh, malicious traffic. And then you could see in the logs, you could say, hey, why are we getting you know, these outbound infections from this machine? Let's go take a look at it and figure out maybe there's uh, something that we need to submit a sample or you know, wipe this machine and, or figure out what, what's going on. So, so if you have an outbound protection that's getting flagged, shouldn't we tell the end user, you know, hey, contact your system administrator? So that, that's, a great, that's a great point. Um, that's the main feedback we've had on that, you know, that we don't uh, pop a detection is that well yeah that makes sense for inbound but why aren't you popping it on outbound so that's something that we're looking at uh, uh, fixing. Yeah. Yeah there there is. Yeah certainly you could build something based on the event uh, the event logs and, and kind of you know roll your own with SCOM um, but we don't have anything built in for that in, into the FEP agent itself. Yeah. Yeah, so you just think about substitute the uh, real time protection that causes you to build a stack as well. So if you if you turned off mid and then turn it back on later, it would give you certain user rights to do that with just real that, that stack. So so the
the question was, if you turn off some of those sub-features in uh, real-time protection, uh, does, that also, does that invalidate the cache? Um, and the answer is uh, no. It, for some of the features, yes for, for others. So it's really the file system mini filter that's gonna invalidate the cache. So as long as you're turning off NIST or behavior monitoring or uh, one of those other features, I was gonna, I guess the machine rebooted because I blue screened it, but um, I was gonna pull it up. But yeah, NIST, behavior monitoring, that's fine. Any, if you're turning off that mini filter, that's what's gonna um, uh, you know, cause that. Well, it doesn't actually invalidate the cache. It causes the uh, uh, diagnostic scan to say, oh, we need to, you know, there was a check window more. of vulnerability we need to check, uh, 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 we need to, you know, scan more stuff. But the, the cache that we build, you know, like during the first scan, or actually we'll build it in the background when the machine's idle, uh, that's still valid. <laughs> yep. No, so uh, the question was, so NIST, are you, are you basically releasing signatures for any network-based vulnerability? Um, right now, we're, we're focused on kind of the critical Windows vulnerabilities. Uh, we're so the MMPC guys, the researchers, we have a team that does the NIST-related stuff, uh, and they're kind of analyzing and deciding which ones are critical enough, are being exploited in the wild, uh, do we want to release to the client? So we're, we're kind of uh, starting slow out of the gate, and, and one of the things we're working on is we just like shipped I think six when we released in uh, uh, you know, December, uh, we've shipped one new NIST signature since then. Every time the new patches come out though, they evaluate and determine, oh, should we, you know, are any of these ones that we wanna ship down to the client? But it's, it's not every network uh, vulnerability. Uh, right now, we're focusing on critical Windows vulnerabilities. SQL, other products are definitely on our roadmap to, uh, to look at. Uh, the technology actually is, is pretty, uh, pretty much would support that, it's more of the, you know, the analysis, and, and there is some work we have to do in the, uh, the GAPA engine, the NIST engine, um, to, for, to support this retirement logic. So making sure that it's only on when it needs to be is a little more complex for uh, non-Windows vulnerabilities. Anything else? Yeah, one more. No, so we're looking at that. Oh, so the question was, is there any tie-in with the NIST and the Windows firewall? If NIST detects something, do you, you know, uh, block a port on the firewall, et cetera? Uh, so we don't have that today. It's definitely on our, our list of things to look at. Okay, well, we're two minutes over. I appreciate your time. If you have more questions, please come by our booth, and we'll be happy to talk with you more. Thanks. Thank you. you bet.